Hi, can you guys hear me? Okay, I should not be at this. One sec. Crap. I, I know it's it it thinks on you. I, I'm gonna have to do it on the incognito here. Hi, sorry you guys could hear us with our little figuring out the tech. We're using a new platform this time, so all right. Where are you guys all like coming in from? Are you guys like where in California or abroad? Well, outside of California. <laughs> Ooh, Woodland Hills, Tarzana, Orange County. Michael, you're in Orange County? Los Altos. Ooh, Vegas. Bay Area, nice, nice. Santa Barbara, France. Where in France, Sonia? Ooh, hi. Hi, Allison. Hi, hi, Alan. You're in Virginia. You're near me. I'm in New York. Oh, okay, okay. Michael, I got it. I got it. Fairfax, Virginia. Oh, Long Beach, Houston. Oh, Paris. I was just there over the summer. So beautiful. Just for a couple of days. Hi, Debbie, San Diego. That's where I'm from. Sacramento. Nice. Oh, Costa Mesa, I used to work there. LA, oh, in the Bahamas. Sacramento. Um, Michael, let me, uh, you can give him the same link. I posted it in the Facebook group. I'm going to do a little poll. Let's see. Okay, what do you guys? Oh, hi from DC, Jersey. Hi, Essie. Did you guys see my poll? Do you see it? <laughs> what about waffles? I don't even know if I agree with the statement. I don't know if I think it's true. Oh, we're getting a lot, a lot of pushback, pushback here. <laughs> Hi, Noelle. Wow, forty-seven fifty-two. Okay, let's do, we're figuring out what's the best breakfast food. I'm going to give people a few minutes to get here just because, you know, time. Um, you know, if people are having tech issues, et cetera. Oh, I, no, I don't mean pancakes versus waffle. That's a very good question. I just mean any breakfast food. Oh, hi, hi, Roxana in Argentina. New Jersey. How far is that from the, from New York? from where how far is Fort Lee yeah I mean I gotta say French toast too Allison like a good like like a good like holla um holla bread uh souffle French toast oh so good so 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 good Orange County waffles you like going for the waffles huh Catherine I do that all the time, Marzella. Like breakfast for dinner is my favorite thing. Wow, a lot of falses now. 
Okay, let's do a different one. Okay, let's do. Well, just while we wait for people to get here. Noelle, is that you? Yep. Okay. Um, I think I'm just gonna have to be here like this. What happens if uh, I'm just gonna start the presentation to see if my video will, my little thing will disappear. Okay. Okay, cool. Yeah, we're good. Okay, cool. Okay, what about this? What's better, French toast or waffles? Omelette waffles. Ooh, Andrew, yeah. Like a good croissant. I wouldn't go chocolate. Like, I just go butter croissant. I, when I was in France, I kept saying just like a plain croissant. People were like, it's a butter croissant. <laughs> I got criticized a little bit. Maybe actually that was in London, not France. But... Oh, a honey butter chicken biscuit. Oh, hi, Lara. Let's see, what are people saying on the poll? French toast better than, I agree. I mean, French toast is just, it's such a treat. Yeah, both are good. Depends, yeah. Honey butter chicken biscuit though. Butter croissant and cappuccino. Yeah, that's where, that's like, but that's like my Tuesday. I mean, like when you want to get like a crazy breakfast, I guess maybe I shouldn't have a butter croissant every week, all the time. For croissant people, have you guys ever tried? I think it's like Galaxy Bakery. They sell them at William Sonoma. You can order like frozen croissants you can heat up at home. They are so good. All right. I'm going to give people just one more minute. Okay. All right. Noelle, we're recording and everything, right? We're good. Oh, a warm butter croissant, so good. I think so. Okay, cool. Ooh, almond, yeah. There's a place, if you ever, if anybody comes, yeah, Galaxy Bakery, I think. Look, just look on William Sonoma for frozen, like for frozen croissants. They're so delicious. Like I'm ordering some to have like for the winter, keep in the house, which is dangerous. Probably a bad idea. Um, all right. So uh, let me do one thing really quickly and get us started. Okay, I am going to add a file. Just give me one second. All right. Share. I just put, you guys should all be able to access it in just a second here. Um, I just added a file. Let me know if y'all can see it. Okay, it says it's sharing. All right, I just shared a file. That's all the Cal Bar questions from this past um, July, just so you have them handy, because I'm going to walk through them. Also, I just wanted y'all to have it handy. Okay, you can see it. All right, good. All right, all right. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and start the presentation now. Give me one second. All right, you guys should be able to see me in a little corner. I'm not having the best hair day, so I like that it's a little photo. All right, can you all see that? We good here? All right, good. Okay, we're good, thank you. All right, so I wanna go over just some preliminary numbers, some preliminary details. 
Um, yeah, they're available online. Like you can get them usually once everybody is done taking the exam, you can download the exam questions. Um, and then we all that do what I do, we, you know, go and comb through them, um, which is, you know, not the funnest thing in the world, but you know, it's what we do. Um, all right. So I'm going to start off by, um, just, you know, talking through a few issues, um, First thing, objectives for today. So by the end of today, by the end of this presentation, and I won't keep you all for too long. I'm going to try to keep it. I can be a little chatty. I'm going to try to keep it to like 90 minutes. Um, so just to give you an idea of how long we'll be here. It's also, um, you want to stay on. Uh, I'll talk about like some future workshops we have coming up, et cetera. So be on the lookout for that. So by the end of today, you're going to understand the scoring for the July 2022 Cal Bar. One thing, um, and then I'm going to really dig in to understanding the issues that were tested in the bar essays and a lot of errors that I've seen that people made. And then also talk about the July 2022 PT. So, um, and I also have next Monday evening, I'm doing a workshop where I'm going to do a real deep dive into the PT from the July 2022 bar. So if you were not happy with your score, um, and don't know where you went wrong, you should definitely, definitely join that particular workshop. It's totally free. You can come and we'll do a deep dive into that PT. I'll go into it a lot deeper than I will tonight. Um, so today you'll understand the scoring, how it worked. I'm going to talk about this particular exam as compared to the last like three bar administrations and how the scoring was um, on the written portion. And then uh, we'll talk about the issues in the July 2022 bar essays. And then I'll talk about the PT. Also, if you all, I think a lot of you, because I recognize so many of your names, if um, hopefully you've done a score review or you've booked a score review and you have it coming up. Um, if you have not, uh, we'll put a link in the chat. We'll put um, in the offers here, an offer to do like a free one-on-one -on -one session. We'll all look at your essays and your PT and I'll look at your MBE scores with you. So that will be, you can sign up for that um, at any time. I'm fairly booked up for the next week, but I'm gonna try to open some additional times as well. So be on the lookout for that. All right. So one quick little thing here, I want to talk about how bar graders grade and the importance of this when you are learning how to, or not even learning how to, but when you're practicing writing your bar essays. So when you're practicing doing that. Um, so if you click on the little offers there, you, there's a link where you can directly uh, book an appointment with me if you haven't already done that, or if you have additional questions or anything like that, um, feel free to do that. So one thing is about how bar graders grade. Bar graders spend, and this is, you know, maybe a little generous on is saying three minutes, but they spend two to three minutes on each essay and on your PT. They do not spend longer than that. So you have to make it really, really simple for the bar grader to see that you hit all the issues that you want to make it so that your analysis jumps off the page because they're not going to dig into it. You make sure it jumps off the page by having good paragraphing, setting things out, always starting your analysis with here. Um, so you really want to do that and make sure that they can absolutely quickly find your analysis so that they can dig right into that because that's really what they care about the most. They don't care if you show, you know, talk about issues that aren't relevant. They don't care if you're giving a ton of law that, that you're not going to analyze. They really want to see the quality of your analysis. And they want to see you spending time on the issues that the bar examiners were really looking for. So they don't dig into it. There was a presentation that the bar examiners gave several years ago. And one of the things they literally said, and I don't, I don't love it, uh, but it kind of gives you a little bit of a peek into the mind of, you know, what people that are doing this are thinking. Um, but they said, we are not archaeologists. We do not dig. So you don't want to make them dig, make it really, really easy, make it very easy for the bar grader to just give you a passing score and move on and gain their trust early. So they look for keywords. They look for a thorough analysis. The bar graders, they know. So a quick little um, primer on how bar grading works for each written event. So for the five essays and for your PT, for each one, you have a unique grader. So there's like a group of people that are grading essay one, a group of people grading essay two, et cetera. So they, and they know the ins and outs of that particular essay very well. So it's easy for them to actually, they know exactly what they, they're looking for. They know where they're looking for it. They know the different ways and like in which people can organize. So you want to make that very easy for them. They don't look twice. And if you do actually get a second read, generally scores drop. I consistently see scores drop so if someone if you do get a second read and you only get a second read 
if you had on your first read with your combined scores of your essay or your written portion and your MBE, you get a second read if you originally had above a 1350, but below a 1390. So you can't request a second read, it just is an automatic process if your score falls into that range. All right, any questions about that? If you do, um, you can put questions in the Q&A and, and I'll get to them and it'll track all the questions we can, uh, and if we don't get to it for some reason, we can send a follow-up email to you as well. So if you do have any questions at all, definitely feel free to put them in the Q&A and, uh, and I'll be looking at this. So somebody asked, what makes the bar graders, what makes the bar examiners decide to do a second read? So everything is graded, scores are tallied. And then if you are above a 1350, but below a 1390, you automatically have all of your essays and your PT read for a second time by a bar grader. And it's generally a different bar grader or it is a different bar grader. So that's when you get to a second read. All right. Scoring, oh, it says July, Feb. It's for the July, 2022. Forgot to delete the Feb there. So scoring for the July, 2022 written portion of the exam. So you needed on each written event, so on your five essays and on your PT, you needed to get a 61.325 or you needed to average a 61.325. Doing that would get you, so that amounts to 430 points approximately. So getting 430 raw written points, that would equate to, it actually comes out to a, uh, to a 1393. So, and let me just tell you all, I've, I've had a lot of people in these score review sessions. I've had a lot of people asking me. Um, people always think that the February exam is harder. It's not. It's absolutely not a harder exam. Yes, the pass rates are lower. I can talk about that in a different session or at the very end. Um, but it's not because the actual exam is more difficult. And to prove that, I went back and looked at the last three bar exam admi administrations. So like this past February, the cut score, or the, not the cut score, the score that you needed to get um, on each written event, so February 2022, you needed to get a 62.781. Um, you need to get a 62.781 or you needed to get 440 raw points. So that that actually was like a tougher, a little bit tougher, but, but generally the written score is going to be, you have to get a higher one if the MBE was considered to be a little bit easier. So it balances it out. Um, in July, 2021, you needed a 60.285 or approximately 422 raw written points. So it was a little bit easier. In February, 2021, you needed a 60.943 or 427. So it's always right around here. Um, it's like the score ranges from, you know, 425, uh, 422 to 440. Um, and that is, that varies with the MBE and how the MBE went. Um, they, the conversion from points to raw score, um, is the formula. And I do, I did a blog post on this. So you could, if you go to bar-md.com, click on the blog, the very first post that's there right now is how to interpret your score letter. But this is in the bulletin for unsuccessful applicants. They give you the formula. So it's right in there. They don't give us the formula for converting your MBEs. That's something, though, that I talk about with everybody in their score review session. So if you have questions about that and about your scores on the MBE, we can talk about that. One thing I'll say, though, on the MBE is um, the numbers on the right side that says percent below and you get all those numbers on the right and where it's talking about your MBE on your score letter. That's not the percent you got correct. That is how you did compared to everybody else. That's your, that is your percentile ranking. So just keep that in mind. That's like some people are seeing, you know, low scores and they're not happy. Um, oh, Andrew, good. Yeah, happy to help. Um, so this people see low scores and they think, oh my God, I got, you know, 10% correct in the subject. If that's not the case, it could be the case, but it's not from that. Those scores aren't telling you that. The scores are telling you, um, it's just telling you how you did compared to everybody else. So it could be that everybody did really well on something or everybody did terribly. And it's just how you did compared to all those other people. If you have like, you know, a lot of high numbers and then a low number and under the percent below, it does tell you if you have one or two that look like outliers, it tells you that those are probably your weaker subjects, but subjects are massive. And, you know, you have to review everything. You actually need to look at your data when you're practicing to say, okay, if I'm not doing well in torts, where is it that I'm not doing well in torts? So you need to really dig in a lot deeper to that data. And that's something I do when I do tutoring with people one-on-one -on -one while, they're, while they're prepping for the bar. All right, next slide. 
we're going to actually get into the uh, essays now. We're going to get into the essays now. And there's a question in the Q&A. Um, it doesn't, it, it's not harder, harder or easier to pass the next February exam. It, that's what I, that's my point is that, is that it's actually averages about the same. Last February, it was fairly, it was, you needed a lower score um, on the written, but that's because the MBE was harder. So it's, it's no test is no test is going to be like one is not easier or harder than the other. They're all equated to be the equal, like equal level of difficulty. So that's exactly what the bar examiners are looking for. And that's what they do to, um, to standardize it. So let's talk about this first essay. So y'all should, if you don't have the back pattern pulled up, you should pull that back pattern up. Um, I shared it. If you click on files, I think I shared that and you can click. Um, I also have uh, the cow bar in the chat to everybody. I just put the document link also in the chat. Oops, actually I put it in the Q&A. So there is the link as well if you want to pull up the cow bar essays. So I'm going to talk through the essay, talk through some of the issues, um, and then I will, um, and then I will talk through what was actually what the bar examiners were looking for. So first essay, this was a contracts and remedies essay, fairly complicated, not not complicated. It was long, a lot of facts, so it's really a racehorse. I find a lot of contracts essays to be really racehorsey, and I feel like the bar examiners often. When they when they go when like the first when you get the first essay i feel like it's often one that's going to stump people or it's going to be a total total racehorse because one of the things they're testing you on is how good are you at managing your time so they always want to they they you know they know that some essays are going to be tougher they know that sometimes like a first question call is going to be really tough but if you can manage your time and get to that last call you're rewarded with kind of an easier question so you really do have to manage your time all right, so this first question says your bath stuff bath, a retailer located in Betaville, sent sent neat sense, an importer located in Sunville, a signed offer to purchase a thousand individually wrapped candles at a price of ten thousand dollars free on board or FOB Betaville. So this already sounds like a contracts essay, right? Sense promptly sent bath a signed acknowledgement accepting the offer, which also included the following language. Some shipping boxes have external water damage. Contents of shipping boxes guaranteed to have no damage. Bath did not respond to the acknowledgement. No other express warranties or disclaimers were stated in the offer or acknowledgement. So there's no other term, but they do state, they do have this disclaimer um, stating that, look, some of the shipping boxes are, have some damage, but the contents are guaranteed to have no damage. Since timely shipped the order to Bath's warehouse using Truckco, a third party common carrier at a freight cost of $400, one quarter of the shipping boxes showed signs of water damage. That's exactly what they said they would have some of the boxes. Each shipping box contained candles that were individually wrapped for retail sale. All candles in individual wrapping were undamaged. So we know that they were supposed to send the candles individually wrapped, undamaged. We know that some of the boxes are going to have some water damage. That's a term of the contract. There's a battle of the forms issue because this is UCC and we're dealing with merchants. It's a battle of the forms issue, UCC 2207. And it looks like, and the term was accepted, it's not a material alteration because it's nothing that's affecting the actual content. So that's part of the contract is that it has, um, it has this term, is that some of the boxes are gonna be damaged. So they're shipped and they are fine. So when the shipment arrived, Bath's employees noticed the water damage on some shipping boxes. I guess they weren't told about the water damage issue. They immediately rejected the shipment without opening any boxes. Doesn't sound like that's a good thing to do promptly notified sense of the rejection and refused to pay any amount. So here, there's a question, and we should have read the call the question first, if we're actually going to do this properly. Uh, I'm assuming, you know, 90% of you have uh, taken the test or maybe have looked at these a little bit. Um, so here, there is a breach issue. And the, the question at the bottom says, did Bath and Sense have a binding contract? And if so, did either party breach the contract? If there was a breach of contract, what damages are likely to be recovered, if any, discuss? Call two says, has Bath or Hot breached their contract? If so, what damages are likely to be recovered, if any? So going back to the fact pattern now, now that we've talked about that, I see here that there's a breach. So there's a question. That, so this is a formation and a breach contracts question and remedies. 
So oftentimes contracts essays are like our formation essays and it'll be really formation heavy or they're breach essays where it's going to be, uh, you know, a lot of breach that's going to say there's a valid contract, but there's going to be a lot of question about was there a breach, a lot of ambiguity you have to talk about whether each side breached. So contract questions, you really, and really every bar question, but with contracts questions in particular, you really have to let the facts guide you. One mistake that I see is people often just go through their checklists. You know, they, you know, they go through, you know, applicable law formation, you know, breach terms, et cetera. And they just go straight through everything. You have to really know where to spend your time. So form, there was a formation issue. Offer wasn't a big issue. They're merchants. But in the acceptance, you had that 2207 battle of the forms issue. And then we get to the breach. And there's a lot of facts here about the breach. Um, and you have to ask, you know, did either side breach? They asked the question, did either party breach? So you have to analyze both. You have to analyze both bath and sense. And here, um, sense sent the order. They sent it timely. They sent it in accord with the terms. And yeah, some of them, some of the boxes were damaged, but nothing inside was damaged. So there's perfect tender because it's UCC. So sense did not breach. Sense did not breach. Bath, on the other hand, bath, they noticed the water damage, but again, that's one of the terms of the contract and they immediately reject it. They don't have the right to reject because there was perfect tender and they don't even open the boxes and check. Um, so, and they, they do promptly notify a sense of the rejection, which is what you do if you're properly rejecting, but they, this was not a proper rejection. So they refuse to pay anything. Their refusal to pay is a breach. So here, bath breached. Sense did not breach, bath breached. So then we want to think about their damages. So well, let's just keep going though, and I'll, go, I'll run through all the issues. So Sense paid Trucco $500 to ship the candles back to Sunville, notified Bath that Sense intended to resell the candles. Sense promptly solicited bids. They're mitigating their damages from all of its customers and received the best offer, which it accepted from Redemption Candles, Redemption of $9,000 FOB Sunville. This is kind of funny. Like a lot of people, I remember, I remember when I was learning in UCC sales, um about fob and all like the risk of loss and, all, and i remember like having such a hard time keeping all that stuff straight they don't test fob very often in the essays they do test it you know almost every time uh, i think in contracts but fob is something that they haven't done in a while in contracts so in the essays so that was kind of interesting so are interesting some of you were probably like oh god which one does it mean uh bath promptly entered into a valid written contract with hot candles so they're telling you it's a valid written contract for the second one so now they're shifting gears to the second call and i'm going to point something out about that to you in a second so bath promptly en entered into a valid written contract with hot candles hot an importer in hatville to purchase a thousand replacement candles for twelve thousand dollars fob hatville truck co was engaged to transport the candles from hatville to betaville in transit, Truckco's truck was struck by lightning in a storm and all of the candles melted. So remember, in transit, right? This is happening in transit. And here, remember that this is FOB. So it's FOB Hatville. So it's FOB. Um, so the duty there, the duty there is once it's left, um, when it, once it has left the seller, the risk of loss transfers to the buyer. So Trucco was engaged. So in transit, Trucco's truck was struck by lightning in a storm and all of the candles melted. Bummer. Trucco's shipping contract disavows liability from acts of God, including lightning. So you want to deal with that, that there is this disclaimer. Um, so Trucco is not. That's all. All that's telling us is that Trucco is not liable. So you can't blame it on Trucco. Bath is going to have to pay for these candles. So Bath refused to pay for the candles and Hot refused to send replacement candles. All right. Bath sued Brent. Sense for breach of contract, sense countersued bath, bath sued hot for uh, breach of contract and hot countersued bath. I don't know about you all, but like reading that and going through it just now, even it's a little bit exhausting. It's a long back pattern and you have to keep all these parties straight. So going back to the, if we go back to my presentation here, if you all, uh, can all still see that, let me find that screen. All right. So essay one, I broke this down into a couple of slides. Most of them I did to make it easy to read. So applicable law, UCC, it's merchants. There are merchants here. So merchant, any special rules that apply to merchants apply. Formation. I wanted to just make some notes here because this, this essay is such a racehorse, you know, and I teach this in the Mastering the, the California Essays class. I talk about triaging a lot. How do you triage? How do you figure out where to spend your time? How do you figure out where to spend your time? 
here, I noted the offer was really easy. Yes, there was an offer. Acceptance had a special issue, battle of the form. Consideration, yeah, it's really easy. Um, did I say the wrong? Bath was a seller. Because they, uh, Bath is a retailer. Seller, Sense is an importer. So Bath has to pay like the wholesale price for the candles they're buying from Neat, from Sense. I think there you, you might be getting the uh, the issues a little bit, um, uh, the parties a little bit mixed up or the issues. Yeah. At the at the top though, at the top. So applicable law formation, yes, it's easy. Um, so consideration, straightforward terms. You want to deal with the fact that it's FOB here. It doesn't make a big deal because there's not not a risk of loss issue here, but just you want to you know address the fact that it's SOB. One issue that you could have addressed here in the beginning is statute of frauds. A lot of people did. It's just not something that was necessary to pass. And you want to know that. Like, I, I want to show you all. I don't want to show you, like, every tiny little thing that you could have possibly included. I want to show you the issues that you definitely should have included to get a passing score to get a 65. So that's where the focus is here. Um, oh, yeah. And you can absolutely, when you're in the exam, you'll have paper copies. You can mark them up. I absolutely. You should absolutely mark them up. And, and, and you should do like, I, I teach a particular strategy to make sure that you're using every fact as well um, when we're in the essay course. And I'll I talk to people about it in our score review as well. So then you have to say, okay, well, did they breach? So was there an offer? Yes, there was a valid offer. There was, there was a valid contract. Then was there a breach? Did Sense breach? Uh, no, Sense, who shipped the candles, did not breach. Did Bath breach by failing to, in to properly inspect and by refusing to pay and send in rejecting them? It was an improper rejection. So did they breach? Yes. Then sense damages, if Bath breached, they did breach. I would go through expectation damages. Not necessarily a lost volume seller. There's nothing that indicates that. I saw a lot of people mention it. I think it's a it's probably a decent inference, but you didn't need, necessarily need to do that. Um, often when they they'll tell you that they're like, they'll tell you that they're a volume seller. So I did see a lot of people address this, um, and I think it was a valid inference. But um, if you didn't address this, it's okay. I just wanted to bring it up because so many people talked about it. And then bath damages if sense breach. They didn't, but then there would be cover damages if they did. But they, you know, they didn't breach. Then has bath or hot, um, has bath or hot breached their contract? If so, what damages are likely to be? Oh, actually, um, I wanted to make one little edit to this. So if so, what damages are likely to be recovered, if any? So the terms address the risk of loss. Where does it transfer? The yes. Um, uh, what did I have here? Let me just check my little note. Oops. Oh, it's weird. It did not. Hang on one second. Give me one second, y'all. Just one second. Because I think okay, I just had my wrong notes pulled up on the left side here. All right, there we go. Okay. So did let's see here. Okay, so has bath or hot? So FOB hat bill and bath has the risk of loss here. Um, breach bath breach because they had the risk of loss. So defenses, I saw a lot of people talk about this and possibility acts of God. So if the risk of loss was on H, was on hot, then that would be a defense, but it's not. So a lot of people spent time on that, but you might've spent time on that and it was unnecessary. That's only applies if the risk of loss was on H um, and, and acts of God. And what that does tell us is that truck co is not liable. That absolutely truck is, truck co is not liable. So, um, so B breached here. B breached here, but the 12,000 candles, but, uh, and they could not be resold. They could not be resold here. So this $12,000 you can get here. So that's essay number one. So a ton, a ton, a ton of issues. One thing I want to point out, one thing I want to point out is just, if you all go back to looking at the fact pattern, if you go back to looking at the fact pattern, there are one, two, three, um, there are three big paragraphs that address the whole first call. 
So, you know, between um, bath and sense, three big paragraphs talk about that. That tells you that, you know, it looks like 75% of the points are going to be within that first call. So you want to really be thorough there, but 25% of the points look like they're in, excuse me, look like they're really in the second call. So there's still a decent amount of points. And that tells us, um, it kind of tells us a bit about the, um, that tells us a bit about the uh, point allocation between the essays or between the calls of the different question. Oh, um, I didn't put, somebody asked me in the, in the uh, Q&A, what type of remedies for number two? It's expectation. It's just regular expectation damages, which is generally the call. That, that's generally going to be the case. That is what is most frequently tested, et cetera. So, uh, all right. Now let's move on to essay number two. And my little dog wants to join in on the fun. So he's going to come say hi for a second. All right. He likes to work with me. All right, SA2 was kind of a dreaded con law question. I know a lot of people don't like con law. So this one, not quite as long as the first one, so a little bit of a breather, but con law, and this is really common. Con law is always like, I think on the bar, there are really two types of questions of essays. There's like racehorse and there's thinkers. There's really not, you know, not anything outside of that. There's there's racehorse and there's thinkers. Um, uh, so this one, so the first one was a classic racehorse. Second one is a bit of a thinker. Kamla, I always think of as a thinker because you have to really come up with arguments, marshal them forward. So when somebody asked in the chat, you know, if the fact kind of discusses merchants, it, is it always good to bring up lost volume seller? No, it's not. It just looked like it here to me because there was like a thousand candles. It's not always, um, like definitely not. All right. So let's look at question number two. So y'all look, pull up, we can put the link back in the chat. If you all uh, don't have that, or if you lost it on your screen, there's the link just for the essay questions again. And we're looking at essay number two now. So we always wanna look at the call to question first. Oh, and Noelle highlighted that link as well for you. So what arguments can Paloma make in support of her first and 14th amendment claims discuss and two, will either or both of district's arguments in support of its motion to dismiss Paloma's lawsuit be successful? Discuss. So we know it's con law. First thing you'd want to do is start thinking, okay, and you know, for those of you that are in my in my California essays course, um, in the essays course, we talk about we, you know, I give you issue checklists for every single subject that you can run through. I talk through it, you know, we come up with mnemonics, stuff like that, to really help make it memorable. We talk about all of the issues to flow through. If you get a free speech essay, what to do, what order to do it in, et cetera. Um, what order to do it in. So we got con law here. So I'm already thinking of, all right, what are all my con law issues? And I would jot down my checklist, but let's run through the facts. So public school district, district in state X is attempting to reduce gang violence in districts high school. Good idea, right? We don't like gang violence. We don't like violence in general, and we don't like them in high schools. Um, so that sounds like a very important interest. I'm going to be, you know, weighing that against an individual's rights, right? That's what we look for. So after consulting with local law enforcement, district has determined that most violence results from confrontations between two gangs, the West Siders and the East Siders. They did the Reds and the Blues a while ago, which is kind of obvious. As a result, district has adopted the following rule for all high school students. All right, anytime you see quoted language like this, we're going to do a facial attack, which we'll get to. It says, no student shall wear any label, insignia, words, colors, signs, or symbols that reflect gang-related activities. So gang-related activities, right? So that is a content-based regulation, and it's what you wear, symbolic speech. So freedom of speech, what you wear is symbolic speech. We want to establish the freedom, you know, First Amendment, you know, applies to the state to the 14th Amendment, um, and then symbolic speech it's expressive conduct because that's what we wear with like the after the draft case you don't have to cite to that but it's um this is very classic con law it says your students violating the policy will be immediately suspended or expelled from school so there's a punishment it's a pretty serious one right if you're in high school you think about going to college all of that stuff for several years paloma a high school senior has had a small tattoo of a dove on her wrist on one wrist 
her self-expression, right? So now they're telling us it's speech, right? They're making it very, very clear. Making it very, very clear. Um, and yeah, I'll get to that in a second. Okay. Right. They're making it very clear that this is symbolic speech, that this is freedom of expression. So Paloma has never been associated with any gang, including the West Siders and East Siders. After learning of Paloma's tattoo, district officials described it to local law enforcement officials who said that it sounded like a West Sider gang symbol, which includes birds. There are like a million birds. Paloma was suspended for the last 10 days of school after she refused district's request that she either wear long sleeves to cover her tattoo or have it removed, right? So they are preventing her expression. They're preventing her expression there, but they do give options. And one thing I wanna point out is like all of these little facts. One thing I talk about in the Mastery in the California Bar Essays course, one of the things that I talk about is like using every little fact and using the, like, the significance of it. One thing I want everybody to do one thing I want every person to do is I want you to go through your essays. I want you to print out these fact patterns, go through your essays, and I want you to you know, read through your, your answer response. And I want you to look for every little fact in the fact pattern. So have them side by side. And I want you to take a highlighter out, right? Take a highlighter and highlight every little fact in the fact pattern that you used, that you explained the significance of, not just one that you typed in, but did you say, okay, you know, the fact that they requested that she wear long sleeves means that she could still have it and express herself outside of school, right? Um, so you have to explain the significance of that. Maybe that weighs in favor of having this rule or having it removed, that makes her stop the speech altogether, at least for now, right? So those two options are two little facts. Did you use each of those? And I call them like each little fact. Because in, in every sentence, you know, not in every sentence, some sentences are just one fact, but oftentimes, oftentimes they will, um, each of the little facts will, or I'm sorry, oftentimes every sentence or the sentences will have multiple facts in them, the so multiple facts in them. So you want to be on the lookout for that. And people always ask me, like, I wrote so much, I addressed so many issues, et cetera. I had this conversation with somebody earlier today and it breaks my heart a bit. Because, you know, I see somebody that's got a ton of knowledge, but you're just not giving them what they're looking for. And you're not using all the facts in the fact pattern. And that's why, and you're not explaining every fact. You might be stating it, but you're not explaining the significance, which is critical, particularly in con law. But explaining that significance is really important. So, um, all right, let's get back to the fact pattern. But that's a great exercise. And for those of you, even if you've already done a score review, if you want to go back and look at these essays and we can look at all the little facts or you can show me that, I think that's a really good thing to do. And if you're not using facts, you know, if you're not using every fact and if you're not, um, you know, making time as in your writing process before you actually start like going full on into writing after you've read through the fact pattern, we go, we have a process that allows you to check for that. So we really, that is, it's critically, critically important. So, all right. So now let's go back to the fact pattern. Paloma, now graduated and attending the college of her choice, has brought a deck, uh, deck relief action. I never know how to say that word. Challenging the validity of the of district's policy under the First and Fourteenth Amendments to the United States Constitution, district has moved to dismiss Paloma's lawsuit as moot on two grounds: a) because she is no longer a high school student, and b) district has now redefined gang related activities in its rule in a matter consistent with the state excess criminal code. All right, so now I'm going to show you all. I'm going to show you all um, what I did as the issue. So now let's go back to my screen. If y'all are looking at me here, so I've got my slides pulled up. These are all of the issues that I would have talked that I would have talked about. So start with the first and fourteenth amendment, standing always, but very very briefly. Like I saw, if you spent a lot of time talking about standing, there was an issue with injury in fact because she's already graduated. Um, so there is an issue with that, but she did suffer an injury because she was she was punished. Um, they asked her, uh, she was suspended, right, for the last 10 days of school, which are like really, really fun, I, you know, as long as it's not in COVID time, um, but really fun. And she so she was suspended. So there is an injury. There is an injury. Um, there, there's absolutely an injury. A lot of people didn't talk about standing here. They talked about it below, but the second call asks directly about mootness. They asked really just about mootness. So let's go through these issues here really quickly. Let me get my hair up. We're getting serious. So standing, state action, then we're going to go into the First Amendment. 
talk about symbolic speech because what the first question is is it speech here it's not spoken so you want to actually establish that this is speech it's expressive conduct is a protected speech the only reason i'm talking about this because usually i don't is i saw quite a few people and i'm like well i can i can buy the argument saying that well is it is displaying a you know a tattoo that that denotes your gang affiliation could that be seen as um you know as like violent speech, right? Inciting imminent lawless action. Pro really, it's not, because um, it's not going to be in, you know, imminent, et cetera. It could be, I guess, but there's no evidence of that in the fact pattern. So we're not going to do that. But I just mentioned it, but you don't need to include that for sure. Then you go into is it content based versus content neutral? So is it content based? Yes, it's content based. They're so talking about regulating gang related activity. So that's content based. You want to go through that, apply strict scrutiny. And that is where you really have to establish, you have to, go through the standard, right? You always, and I go into like, really, how do you come up with those arguments? I teach that. And like, I went through this in the essay class. Like I literally went through verbatim, step-by-step, step, how do you construct these arguments? Cause these are hard. It's always hard to do con law. Um, so content-based first establish that it is content-based and then go into whether or not there's strict scrutiny. So all of these, um, all of these headings here, these are be my headings in this essay. So this is how I would have organized it. Then is it content neutral, right? Because it's just, you know, that reflect gang related activities. It's really not going to be content neutral, but somehow if the court viewed it that way, it's an immediate scrutiny. Then is it a time, place, manner restriction? So um, here it's just anything that reflects gang related. I was hesitant to do this. I was hesitant to do this, but because it's in the school and it's students, um, then it's then that's why i talked about okay would it be a limited public forum you want you want to go through public forum limited public non-public what do you think it is and i saw arguments all over the place here uh i saw them kind of all over the place here and there's not a lot of facts that go to that other than the fact that it's a school um so it's either probably going to be limited public or non-public i should have had non-public on there too then for speech you always want to run through i call it the four horsemen overbroad because it's you can't wear here if we look at the language of it any label insignia words color signs or symbols that reflect gang related activities right so overbroad means that you're regulating both protected and unprotected speech so here you're wearing you know wearing red right if i wear a red sweater right like that's over like i can wear that right and what if i want to wear a christmas sweater right or something like that um you know it's it's restricting both protected and unprotected speech especially if you wear like a religious one Right, because then that's getting into your like that would be a whole other thing. Uh, but it's overbroad. It's very overbroad. Vague. What does all of this mean? That reflects gang-related activities. Like that's vague. We don't know what that is. I have no idea what that is. Paloma has no idea what that is. Um, she's never been involved. So I would say here she's never been involved. So how is she supposed to know? And she has a dove on her wrist to demonstrate that she's a peaceful person, which is like the opposite of being in a gang. So it's vague. It's definitely, definitely vague. Here. Um, somebody asked me in the Q and A, do you have to give an analysis of all the facts or just the core facts? All the facts. It, you have to, yeah, and Paloma means, I know that. <laughs> oh, is that Noelle, is that you telling me that? Yes, Paloma does mean dub in Spanish um, as well. Um, all right. So overbroad vague, is this a prior restraint, prevented speech before it happens? Yes, you know, I always sort of throw it in there. It's really simple. It's, I would do that really quickly. And then unfettered discretion. They showed it to the police and they're like, well, it could be, right? Because they also use birds, right? Like that's just giving the police here unfettered discretion to decide what is and is not a violation and the school officials. So there's absolutely unfettered discretion here. So you need to use the facts here. Also, I saw a lot of people miss this, substitute due process, procedural due process. Here, there's a liberty interest at stake. She's, this is freedom of speech issue. So I saw a lot of people miss this and a lot of people miss procedural. You would do both of these. It's fairly straightforward here, but you still need to do these arguments and run through these issues. I saw a lot of people miss that and also just not know how to do that analysis. That's one thing I love showing people that like I was always frustrated by when I studied for the bar and like when I was in law school, I want someone to show me how do I do this analysis? Like what steps do I need to go through? What steps do I need to go through? And on that note, I have a book coming out where I give you templates and talk through all a lot of the how. It's coming out, it'll come out in December. Um, and uh, you can let us know. Uh, you can send a private message to us and we can add you to the list of like people that we can let you know when that comes out. Um, all right, so let's go on to the next one. Oh, this is question. Oops, that just got in there twice. Okay, 
the second call, the second call. Um, yeah, so some people are asking, how do you finish? You have to manage your time. So you're supposed to use all the facts. You are supposed to use all of that. You want to, and I do make sure, like, I will show you how to get all of them in there. Sometimes it's the way that you write a sentence, right? Using it's because of this fact, this fact, this fact, this fact, this fact. So all of sometimes multiple facts go to support your claim, but that that is something that we that we talk about. Um, yeah. So I'm not going to go further than that on that question. So will either or both of um, the district's argument in support of its motion to dismiss be successful? So these are the two arguments that P is no longer a high school student. We have to talk about how you know whether or not that's moot. District redefining gang related activities in a matter consistent with the state X's criminal code mootness. Now, on this point. I think in particular, you have to remember that a state criminal law can also be unconstitutional. So even if it's consistent with the state X criminal code doesn't mean that it's legal. So that is not sufficient. That is not sufficient. So I think you had to really address that there and like, just, you know, you can bring in outside knowledge, you can bring in knowledge, like general legal knowledge into this. All right, let's get to this third essay, PR. So PR, now let's switch back to looking at the fact pattern and I'll put this link in the chat again, just so you have it, make it a little bit easier. Everybody. So I just put it in there at the top as well. And Noelle, if you wanna highlight that. All right. And yeah, Debbie, it is, it is. And you'll get sent the recording afterwards, et cetera. All right, so let's look at the third question. Let's look at the third question. All right, so Clint hire. so let's look at the call of the question first. What ethical violations, if any, has been committed, discussed, answer according to California ABA? Straight PR, we love this. PR can be complicated. Um, and PR is also another one that's a little bit tricky to organize. If you wanna see a sample of what our essays course is like on our YouTube channel, I've taught, I have like a preview of PR. And it's, it's a full essay um, and I, I go into PR, et cetera, um, but you should definitely check that out if you're curious about that. And if you have, if you struggle with PR essays, cause I think they can be tough. I think they can be really tough to organize to like really organize your thoughts and all the facts. Um, so this says Clint, could be the client, hired Linda, a lawyer to represent him in a personal injury lawsuit against Dan, the driver of the car that collided with Clint's car, thereby causing him serious bodily injury. Clint could not afford to pay Linda, so Linda told Clint not to worry about paying anything until there was a recovery in the case. So he couldn't afford to pay her. So one, this is getting at a contingency. Two, is this getting at uh, her fronting fees and costs, right? And there's rules on that with ABA in California. All right. All right. Linda told Clint that if, rec if a recovery is obtained, Linda would take 50% as her attorney fee and Clint will get the other half, less any costs Linda incurred. Whenever they tell you about the quantity of the fees, right? Or if they tell you about how much, right? Whenever they give you the rate, you always have to talk about the reasonableness of the rate. And remember, right? A lot of people, the mistake I saw a lot of people make is that um, this settled quickly. That doesn't matter because the, the litigation doesn't start until after you sign the agreement. So you can't later look at the fact that it settled quickly to say that it was unfair. It's not how that works at all. And hopefully you will all, you know, experience that in a positive way in the long term. Um, so she would take 50% as her attorney fee and Clint will get the other half less any cost and occur, incurred. Clint orally agreed to this fee arrangement. So the fact that he orally agreed tells us that it wasn't in writing. This is something a contingency fee needs to be in writing. So here we have a couple of different issues. We have potentially loaning funds to a client or um, fronting costs, which I think you can do in California, but ABA doesn't allow, if I'm remembering correctly. I haven't looked at it in a little bit. Um, looking at the reasonableness of the rate and you're looking at the contingency fee and the fact that it's not in writing. So three issues, three bigger issues here. We also have a... Um, you know, we have an attorney client uh, relationship that it's established. I always like to sort of start with that to wrap my head around and talk about what's the scope of the lawyer, scope of the client. Um, this is telling us it's a personal injury lawsuit. A lot of people talked about the duty of competence. There's this isn't really testing duty of competence because we don't know her experience with it. But assuming that she has handled um, bodily injury, like personal injury cases, should be fine. 
generally the, the way that they test a person, the duty of competence is they'll have like a wills and trust lawyer handling a personal injury or a personal injury lawyer handling a wills and trust case, et cetera. So, um, so yeah, so you didn't really need to do duty of competence. You won't see it in my checklist. All right, next paragraph. Dan's insurance company, Acme Insurance, emailed Linda before Linda completed any substantive work on the case. So before she did anything. So you want to talk about that and the reason why stuff. So like that fact is designed to have you talk about the fact that the reasonableness of, of her rate is not dictated on the fact that she didn't do any substantive work, right? They had the contract, she took on the risk. All right, so they offered to settle the matter for $100,000. All right, so they make an offer to settle, you have a duty to communicate settlement offers and that the decision to accept is with completely within the client's control. So not the, the attorney's decision, we can advise, but we cannot say, we cannot accept on the client's behalf. Um, unless the client gives us approval. Linda was thrilled and replied to the email that she accepted the settlement offer. So she accepts it, does it before she tells Clint. Linda then told Clint about the settlement. Clint was relieved that the case settled so quickly. So they're giving you all of these facts about the settlement that, you know, um, that she didn't do any substantive work, that she replied, she immediately accepted it. Then she tells Clint and the fact that he's relieved. The fact that he's relieved does not relieve Linda of any ethical violations. She violated by not communicating first. So violated the duty to communicate and um, stepped outside her role, stepped outside her role here. So Acme delivered a check for $100,000 payable to Linda. Lots of money stuff going on, lots of financial uh, issues here. Linda then wrote a check from that account to Clint for $50,000 minus her costs and mailed it to him. So she did it per the terms of the agreement. Obviously, there's going to be a dispute. These are very predictable. Upon receipt of the check, Clint complained about Linda's fee and threatened to sue Linda for malpractice and report her to the state bar. Um, Linda offered to return $10,000 of the fee in exchange for an agreement releasing Linda from all liability associated with representation. Clint accepted and executed the release. So fee dispute. What do you do when there's a fee dispute? She also deposited into her law firm's business account, not a client trust account. Two violations there. Um, she mailed him the check and then she negotiates. This is limiting malpractice liability. You can't do that. That's a duty of loyalty issue. Um, I think actually ABA might allow it. California definitely doesn't. So there's a lot of distinctions here that are triggered um, for you to talk about. So make sure you know and address those California ABA distinctions, which I know is obvious, but you need to really focus on where are those major distinctions. Like that's a pretty big distinction. So um, threatens to sue. All right. Um, and then he executes the agreement. So even if he's okay with it, it's still a, a violation of her ethical duties. So these are the issues. You could also organize this a slightly different way. You could also organize it really just by the fact. So I know a lot of people go like, they'll put each factual scenario at the top and talk about the issues, talk about the legal issues under it. I always set it up with the legal issues. With, I don't always, but this one I like this way. So attorney-client relationship, I always like to establish that. Then duty, financial responsibility, contingent fees, you know, the fact that it needs to be in writing, Linda's rate, the 50%. There's a number of facts about this. You want to use all of the facts here. And then commingling funds, the fact she deposited into her uh, business account, not a client trust account. Then scope of attorney client. This is talking about the fact that she made the decision to accept um, and that that was outside of her role as uh, as advisor, that client, you know, attorney, client controls the ends, lawyer controls the means of how to get there. So she violated her, she stepped outside her scope of her uh, advisory role. Then the duty to communicate, she has to communicate settlement offers. There's a lot of overlap here, but I still separate them out. Then what do you do when there's a fee dispute? You could also do that under duty of financial responsibility and then duty of loyalty, financial. So two things, finding providing that financial assistance to the client. That's a conflict of interest between the lawyer and the client and also limiting malpractice. So somewhat straightforward on this particular essay, um, but still, I, I thought this essay to me, this essay was a little bit easier for PR because I've just seen some brutal ones. So um, yeah, I thought this was a, was a little bit easier. All right, y'all doing okay? You wanna do just like, let's take like a little four minute breather for just a minute. Stretch a little bit and then we'll get to these last, the second half of the essays and we'll talk about the PT. And let's do, I'll do another poll. Let's, I like breakfast food.
sorry if you're vegan. Then if you're vegan, do the vegan version. All right, what's better, bacon or sausage? We'll do this for three minutes. Take a little deep breath. And I'm going to have a sip of water. Wow, we're 50-50? That's actually kind of amazing. Turkey bacon, 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 bacon. Michael, it's an either or. It's an either or, Michael. Oh, bacon's taking the lead. Do you, do you just feel like bacon sort of invaded like everything in restaurants like in the last 10 years? Like there's just bacon everything, which I'm not complaining about. That is not a complaint. Okay, now, yeah, bacon's taking a solid lead, which I like. Well, I mean, I do love some sausage. Sausage dip and syrup, it's like salty and sweet, so good. Now I'm, I'm going out to breakfast tomorrow with a friend. I'm excited. I'm gonna have some bacon. All right, take two more minutes. Grab a sip of water if you need to. Oh, who all is here? Michael here. Who do I know? Lada, I know you. Ravina, sorry, I think we had to move your appointment, but thank you for being flexible. Debbie, hi. Tina, hi. Humphrey, Chatterley, and Lucene, how are you guys? Nikki, and Marcella, and Emmanuel. So nice. Allison, Chizoba, Franny, right? Miriam, Andrea, did we speak? I think we did. Angelica, Anna. How's this poll going? Oh, I think sausage got nicked up a little bit. Vacant's is the clear winner. Yeah. Christy, do I know you from law school? From the where I taught, not from when we bent. Tina, if you guys, if, you, if you're here and you missed part of this, I think that a recording will be sent to you actually afterwards so that you can watch any, you know, you can watch it. All right, let's get back into it. Y'all ready? Yeah, okay, I thought so, Christy. Hi. Make sure you set an appointment with me if you haven't yet. For all of you, make sure if you guys uh, want to go over your essays, if you want, because sometimes people are like, I talked about all this stuff, but you didn't get a passing score. I'll show you where you missed it. Um, Jasmine, yeah, I'm going to probably go in, like somebody else canceled for Monday morning, uh, if you want to look at that. Um, if you didn't, if you haven't gotten your score review, I'm going to try to open up some more time slots. I have some slots, I think, on Wednesday, um, so the day before Thanksgiving, um, that I'm going to open up. So, so check that out. Check that out. Um, and I probably will open a little bit more just because there was such a strong demand with because scores came out on a Thursday, which is wild. Um, all right. So let's get back to it. Let's look at essay four, which was dreaded, like absolutely dreaded. So essay four. Uh, it's, and this one, a lot of people, you know, this is like a two pager. This is a two pager. Jasmine also just. Um, Send me a, a private message with your email too, and I'll make sure that I get you in there. All right. So four questions. Is the agreement between Aaliyah and Bowen valid? Discuss. Is Daya bound by Aaliyah and Bowen's voting agreement with respect to the election of successor directors? Discuss. On what theory or theories, if any, might Escar bring an action to enjoin court from moving solely into manufacturing and bicycles? And what is the likely outcome? Discuss. And then on what theory or theories, if any, might Escar bring an action for damages against Palmer related to court moving solely into manufacturing bicycles? And what is the likely outcome? 
this thing just sucked. Like, I hate to say that, but like, it just did. This was dreaded. I don't know. I want to talk to people well, later on when my class starts, but I actually, in the essay class this time, I talked about shareholder agreements and I actually went through this because in BA is where the bar examiners love to give you the like OMG essays. Like, what is this? It is so often, so, so, so often it is in business associations. It's where people are just like, what is this? And I'm going to talk about like, this is some of the stuff that I teach. Like, what do you do when you see this and you just don't know what to do? I'm going to show you that. This is like a little preview of what we do in the essay class. So the Articles of Incorporation for Corp Inc. Corp. provide that it is a closely held corporation formed for the purpose of manufacturing television. So closely held, formed for the purpose of manufacturing televisions. Whenever they tell you what the purpose was, then you're, it's going to be an ultravirus issue. Corp. Is also has been highly profitable in this business for 20 years. The articles also provide that for the purpose of electing directors, each shareholder shall have one vote per share that they own multiplied by the number of open director positions, i.e. cumulative voting. Um, all right, cool, Jasmine. Uh, so talking about cumulative voting, like everybody was probably just like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, right? When they saw this. So like, this is one of those essays you're just like, you look at it like for me it was essay number one that was like this right you're not expecting it this is like the weird issue and i will just tell you you will have an essay for those who are taking february i think most of you you will have an essay that feels like this and you need to know what to do it's critical 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 so something i talked about in the essay class alia and bowen each own sufficient shares to elect through cumulative voting one of the three directors of court Aliyah and Bowen entered into a signed written agreement stating that they will vote. So look at this. They will vote to elect themselves to the board of court and agree on the election of. So one, they will vote to elect themselves to the board Two, agree on the election of any successor board members. And if they cannot agree on a particular successor, they will abstain from voting. So three things there. They also so there's three terms of the agreement, right? Three terms of the agreement. They also agreed that once they became directors, they would select Palmer as the new president. So that's four terms of the agreement. The, the agreement stipulated that it is binding on all subsequent owners of the shares. So there's five terms of the agreement here, right? Break them up. You have to, if you break it up, then you'll say, okay, well, what makes sense here? Like who elects directors? Who elects officers? Who elects the president? What about voting agreements? I know we can do voting agreements, but what are the rules? What's reasonable? What makes sense, right? What makes sense? So there's five terms. I'll talk about that in a minute. Aaliyah and Bowen were subsequently elected to Corp's board of directors along with Chantal. At the next board meeting, so nice ABC, Aaliyah and Bowen voted to select Palmer as the new president of Corp. Chantal abstained and Palmer was named as president. So Chantal abstained. Palmer's named as president. Palmer immediately instituted several costly changes intended to shift Corp solely into the manufacturing of bicycles. So he's shifting it, right? That's an ultravirus act. Palmer reasoned that by the time the directors heard anything about the changes, so it sounds so, it doesn't sound like he didn't, he didn't tell anybody, right? Are you acting in the best interest of the corporation by making a massive change, right? By making a massive change and, um, and not, telling, not telling the directors about it, like that's kind of nuts. That's kind of nuts. Uh, but he figures that by the time Eddie made heard about it, Corp would be so profitable that no one would complain. Bowen discovered almost immediately what Palmer had done. Bowen then informed Daya or Daya of all of these facts, sold his shares to her and resigned from the board. All right, so we have all of this stuff going on, right? And you're just like, I don't even know. I would look at this. I looked at this when I first looked at this. Like, this is my answer to how I looked at this when I was like the, my very first impression of it. Like, how would I do this if I were in your shoes on the bar? Although, like, you know, I'm obviously sitting in my apartment, you know, I'm not in the bar, there's a lot less pressure, but I will, you know, uh, this was my impression, my answer that I'm going to share with you in a second. So, Esgar, a shareholder of Corp, uh, since its inception, wishes to seek legal relief regarding Palmer's action and Corp's change to solely manufacturing bicycles. So, we have all those four questions that we already read. So, this is how I would have done it. This is how I would have done it. And Archie, our little mascot, wants to come and say hello again. So we're going to bring him up here again so he doesn't get very noisy. All right. So 
this is how I would have done it. Is the agreement between Aaliyah and Bowen valid? Shareholder agreements. Shareholder agreements are valid. Not all these terms are. Um, I'll also up, I'll upload my um, my notes that have the rules and everything as well. So if you guys join our free workshops, if you're signed up for our, um, if you come to our future ones, et cetera, we post all these videos in a course on free, web, um, called free, I think it's called just free workshops um, on our website. And um, we, we post everything there and that way you can get access to this PowerPoint. You can see it, I'll upload my notes as well that show you um, you know, where, what facts are, where some of these rules, et cetera. You don't have to memorize these rules. I would say it's not likely that these particular rules are going to get tested on the next one, but just a point. But this is how I would have done it, right? Electing Aliyah and Bowen, right? That they were, and I, what did they elect themselves to as, uh, uh, da, 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 to the board, right? So they're board members, right? Who gets to elect the board, right? So then you want to think of a rule, okay? They're electing the board, make up a rule about who gets to elect people to the board. Right there, they are majority shareholders. That makes sense. So it's probably okay, right? Electing successor directors, that might be problematic. That depends, right? There's a really nuanced rule on that. That depends. Um, abstaining from voting, that was another term. I'm like, can you vote to make your other person abstain from voting? Like, can you have an agreement to do that? That could actually make, make it so that you could never get a quorum. If you can never get a quorum, you might not be able to elect people. That could actually be invalid. So that's really problematic. So if you go through each of these facts and just say, okay, remember I said using every single fact, so many people just talked about the shareholder agreement generally. And I think that's why there were such low scores on this essay in large part. Because even if you don't know the rule, if you use the facts, you can make up a rule and it will make sense. And I go into a lot into depth into like, how do you make up a rule? I do exercises in the class where I give you guys, and I actually did it on shareholder agreements this time, I think. Um, I did like a few of them, but I, you know, we, there's skill in making up a rule and we talk about how to do that. So and then is Daya bound by Aliyah Bowen's voting agreement with respect to the election of successor directors, so election of directors, probably she's not going to be bound in this one. That's what you should have come to because there was an invalid, it could result in an invalid, um, uh, in the inability to elect someone. So that's probably going to be, uh, not allowed on what theory theories, if any, might Escar bring an action to enjoin? If you're doing an old, so I talked about, you don't have to do direct action, derivative action, et cetera. This would be a derivative action and ultra virus acts. That was the only thing I really talked about. That's what was necessary. People talked about a variety of other issues as well that I saw. Um, but um, I think this is what was necessary. I've seen other people talk about um, fundamental corporate change. I think that could have been in the second one, but really maybe in here, I think that you could have done that because changing the manufacturing is obviously going to be a fundamental corporate change. And there's a lot of formalities that go with that, et cetera. So you could have done that as well. But the big thing here was the Ultra Virus Act. The call, oh, this should have said, where's three? Oh, that was three, okay. And then number four, on what theories uh, might ESCO bring an action for damages against Palmer related to solely moving to manufacturing bicycles? What's the likely outcome? I would again, you know, derivative action, I would have talked about um, duty of care, with the duty of care business judgment rule and I don't think it was necessary, but duty of loyalty, you could talk about because under the duty of loyalty, you're supposed to act in the best interest of the corporation. Usually the way that that's violated is by acting in your own self-interest, but there is part of it. I think you could talk about it. And a lot of people did about talking about not acting in the best interest of the corporation because duty of care is acting as a reasonable director would. There is not a um, one note on this. A lot of people talked about piercing the corporate veil, but you don't need to do that because um because they are on the they're on the board of directors they're not officers it's officers that you sue for that it's officers that you sue for that so that's why i didn't have to do that all right and then last but not least we have this kind of brutal community property wills and trusts essay where there was just a lot of ambiguity here you had to really know how to deal with ambiguity so people just were not big fans of this. I saw, I've surprisingly seen a lot of low, like low scores on this one. And, um, and I don't usually, not in, S, not in community property wills and trusts. Usually that's where I see really high scores and people are always surprised. All right, so we're gonna switch back over to the fact pattern. I'm gonna read through it. So it's just what rights, if any, do Wanda, Samir, and Deepa have in Harry's estate to discuss. So the initials here tell us we're in community property wills and trusts. So wife, son, daughter, husband are the names. So Harry and Wanda were married to each other for 20 years, being domiciled in state X, a non-community property state, 
for the first 15 years and thereafter until Hari's death being domiciled in California for five years. So quasi community property here. At Hari's death in 2020, two documents. And then I'm just like, did he, was it was a COVID. I'm just like, it's a little sad. Um, I wish they just would have done a different year. Two documents were submitted for probate. And this is where there's a lot of the ambiguity. A lot of people, I think, saw that, um, although they said it twice, which means they really wanted you to pay attention. A lot of people thought this was will number one and will number two or document number two. But it's not, it's unclear which one came first. So there's special rules that come up with that. So this was testing a bit of nuance. This is testing a bit of nuance. All right. Oh, gee. Let me go down now. So one, a formal will signed by Hari and witness one on June 1, 2018, and signed by witness two on June 3rd, 2018. They're not both present. So this is not, you know, properly done. That's okay. Both witnesses were disinterested. This document left all of Hari's, all of Hari's community property to Wanda, but did not mention any separate or quasi community property. So he leaves all of his community property to, to his wife. Right, so we deal with that. So this is a will, it's a formal will. It's not executed properly. You would bring in harmless error doctrine and it would probably be okay. So, you, so this one looks like it's valid. And then you have the second document, an undated, an undated pre-printed will form that had printing at the top, declaring that it was intended to be a will on the form that Hari had written in his own handwriting. So this looks like it's a holographic, all of my separate property and 25% of my community property goes to my son, Samir. Hari signed the will form, but no witness assigned it, and there was no date on the form. So here, you're dealing with, this looks like a holographic codicil. It's not disposing of the entire state. It's handwritten, et cetera. It doesn't have the other, the other formalities. So here, in this one, in this, in this first document, it, it says here, it does dispose of the community property, but it doesn't mention separate or quasi-community property. And the second one, whenever it's dated, if it was first or if it's second, then and it's un, it's unclear um and if it's unclear you're going to look to the to the testator's intent so here it says all of my separate property and 25 percent of my community property goes to my son samir so he does dispose of all of the separate property um and 25 percent of the community property right so you have that notice though um uh that wanda is omitted on the second one wanda is omitted on the second one so you might talk about how she was omitted from the second one but it's probably not going to create an issue um, but you want to talk about the discrepancy here, namely with the 25% community property here and all of the community property here. And also the fact that there's quasi community property. Um, oh, here. So this is all dealing with community property though. Um, you can leave when it comes to community property, this is a rule that not a lot of people know, but you can leave up to half of your community property to somebody other than your partner. So. Hari signed the will form, but no witness assigned it and there was no date on the form. So it's a holographic codicil. Hari had full mental capacity through his life. They don't want you to deal with capacity issues. At his death, Hari's property consisted of separate property worth 100,000, community property, Harry's half being worth 50,000, and California land worth 100,000, which Hari had bought with his earnings while he and Wanda were still living in State X. So while they're still living in State X, which is um, a non-community property state, so he had bought this with uh not with quasi community property so what do you do with that you talk about quasi community property here then in 2017 without wanda's written consent so in 2017 while they were living in the um community property state in state x um or i'm sorry in uh california rather in 2017 he gave the land to himself and to his daughter deep as joint tenants on her birthday so he gives this land um, so this is also a gift. Uh, this is also a gift, but it's real property, et cetera. So there's several issues to talk about there. So what rights, if any, do Wanda, Samir, and Deepa have in Hari's estate? One thing I want to say, I'm not even going to get into the calculating on this essay. Um, you do want to talk about the distribution and, you know, so-and-so gets half. The numbers are easy and you can do it. But I just want to talk about, like, what do you do with this essay? There's a lot of ambiguity. So I always start with the call to question. And I'm gonna, you could have started with the wills. I started with community property. So community property, quasi community property. And then I'm gonna go through the wills. I just call it document one. So valid will formally attested, uh, doesn't mention what to do with a separate or quasi community property. So if, if this is operative, non-separate or quasi community property would go through intestacy. So you'd wanna deal with that. So it tells you, we wanna figure out legally what documents and what property is operative, like what documents 
it, what document is operative, what property does it deal with, and how does that affect um, what goes through the test state and what goes through intestacy. Again, we have the error with the witnesses, so but that's still going to be under the harmless error doctrine. That's going to be saved. So valid document one is valid. Document two, holographic hot of still doesn't dispose of all community property, but it does dispose of the separate property. You can do that. Then revocation of will one. So a lot of people talked about this, but it's unclear. If document two is written after document one, then it could uh, potentially partially, then it could partially revoke because of the 25% community property. You can dispose, dispose of half of community property. So this revoked potentially 25% of the community property gift from document one. Um, and document one doesn't say anything about like, I, re, you know, I revoke my prior will. It doesn't do anything. Um, so you'd want to talk about the revocation that there's two documents, et cetera. But we're going to say, we're going to try to read these together. So, right. So reading them together. Then we're going to go through these issues. So first omitted spouse, not that she's omitted entirely, but she's not mentioned in the second will or in the second document rather. She's not mentioned in document two. So we want to deal with that, but she is mentioned in document one. Then we do have an omitted child, Deepa, right? So we'd want to say, okay, well, she's an omitted child. So if anything goes through intestacy, she's going to get a portion of it. She's going to get yeah, a portion of that. Then you have the separate property worth $100,000. That's probably going to go to Samir because everything was left to him and that separate property, not community. And then community property, house half being uh, worth 50000 Oh, I, the California land got deleted. So the California land, let me talk about that since then I'll update it before we post this. Um, the California land worth $100,000. So you have to deal with a lot there. And notice, if you look at the fact pattern, that's a big paragraph right? There are more facts there that tells you that that's a bigger issue and you need to spend more time there. So you need to spend more time there. So you look at like, you know, capacity, right? He, Harry had full mental capacity throughout his life for Harry, right? So you look at the quantity of facts with this property, with the California land compared to something else, the capacity. I saw people do like a decent chunk on capacity. That's not a good use of time, but you do want to go through all the issues that it was bought with, they were still living in state X in a non-community property state, but he bought it with his earnings. Um, so is a community property, is a separate property. And then in 2017, without, without Wanda's con written consent, so is that a breach of a fiduciary duty? I don't know. But he gave the land to himself and his daughter. So taking title and name alone, Deepa as joint tenants on her birthday. And also, is that an excessive gift, right? Is that, an, that's a gift because it's on her birthday. Like, I'm like, well, why did they say that it was on her birthday? Oh, so maybe they want me to talk about a gift. So a gift of, you know, excessive relevant, uh, relative value. So a lot of issues with that California land. Sorry, it's not here. I'll fix that. Um, and then after we go through all of these issues, because now we've thought, like really thought through everything, we've written through it, then we want to do the distribution. All right. So that one was a bit of a doozy, I thought, for a community property wills and trusts. It's one of the tougher ones that I've seen in a long time. So I thought this one was really hard. They haven't done quasi community property since like 2019 either. So tough, um, but they don't do it all that often. So three years. All right, so now let's talk about the PT. I am doing, like I said, um, like I said at the beginning and you can register for it on Monday evening, I am doing a PT workshop where I'm gonna do a deep dive. So I'm just gonna kind of go through this one and then I'll have time for questions. So you had to write an objective memo. It was really rule heavy, like really rule heavy. Uh, a very heavy factual discussion was required of analogizing to and distinguishing from facts. And remember that that new instruction was added to the uh, PTs for February, 2022. Um, and it is still on it and it will be an instruction going forward. So you need to look for this stuff. You need to look for this stuff. So reconcile the disputing facts. So I'm gonna talk about what that was, what this PT looked like, what you had to do. And again, I'll go through this on We'll have a fun Monday night together. All right. So you would want to have a quick intro. And then uh, under that, your analysis should be number two. So the issues here, this is what I want you all to look at. So whether Nisi would prove Hardy's statements as quoted in the complaint were defamatory if he were to prove the facts alleged. Two cases to use here. So this is the bigger issue. There's two cases that you had to use on this issue. And there were two statements you had to analyze. There were two statements you had to analyze. So using these two cases, analogizing, distinguishing, et cetera. Uh, and you can see that this was really probably one of the biggest issues. And I'll tell you why. 
So this statement, it was much longer, but I just, you know, drilled it down to the, the essential part of it was that Jack Nisi is guilty of cable theft. And that you're saying he is guilty of cable theft. Um, it was stated in a factual manner because it says he is guilty. So I thought that that was bad. There's ambiguity. However, if you look at Anderson, you could distinguish from Anderson because it doesn't go as far as in Anderson in that case, they label it like factual statement. Um, so whenever they give you two cases, ours is going to generally fall in the middle and you have to have counter arguments. You have to explain why it's distinguished from Anderson. Why is it not like that case? So you really have to do a deep dive into the facts and explain our case and compare it to Anderson. And then you also have to do a deep dive and say why this is more like Inski because ours isn't as, you know, um, it's ours is a little bit more affirmative than the statement in Inski. So you have to really do a lot of heavy lifting with the facts here. There's a lot of rule, et cetera. The other, other big thing is you have to analyze, was this defamation? Was this defamation? Almost every PT that I've looked at that hasn't been passing forgot to analyze the rest of the elements of defamation. The big, the big thing that is talked about in Anderson and Inski is whether this could be construed as opinion and not a factual statement, right? That is one element of defamation, and that was certainly the biggest element here, but you still have to do the rest of the elements. And if you look at the complaint, they have facts for each, they have facts for every element. So they gave you those facts. They gave you those facts. You had to deal with it. If you didn't do that, you're missing issues. Um, so again, you had to have a counter argument here. It says it stated factually, and you see is guilty, and it's, I would conclude that it was opinion, but it could go. I've seen people conclude both ways on this, and I found the, the arguments compelling, and I've seen high enough scores with it going both ways. So statement two, that he's cheating on his wife. This one was less factual in manner than the first one. So this one's a little bit more straightforward, I thought, and then you analogize to Inski. So notice here, two cases to use, plus a counter argument that tells us where we have to spend our time. But you still need to know how much time to spend on the other issues because there's a lot going on in the second um, in the second issue as well. So a lot of people spent too much time here, not enough here, or they didn't separate the statements. Like you got to separate these statements out and I'll show you really how to do that um, on Monday. All right, and then we have the next issue. Oops, oh, I got a little bit twisted around, that's why. Um, whether Gossing is immune from liability for Hardy's alleged defamatory statements. So whether he's immune from liability. So case, the case, you had one case you had to use, but it went into pretty big detail. You had to distinguish from roommate. And one thing, so I say you analogize to or distinguish from, you have to be in California. This is different from the UBE. Um, in California, you have to, they, on every PT, since we switched to having one PT, because prior to 2017, prior to July 2017, we used to do two three-hour PTs. It was, the exam was three days. Now it's two days, one 90-minute PT. And with a 90 minute PT in California, the, I have seen every single time you have to distinguish the facts. You have to do some distinguishing and some analogizing too. So that's a skill that you have to get comfortable with and know how to do. And here you had to, like, there were three kind of big in the case and roommate, they went into three different analyses. And so that tells us that we need to do three different analyses, um, like a fact. So here I would have had like three paragraphs of analysis dealing with, um, dealing with the categories that were in roommate. Um, so, and that's what I have these categories. So I'd have a paragraph about how the questionnaire does not have discriminatory categories like in roommate. The only basis for discrimination in CCCU was gender. So this is not development. And I would actually deal with this quite a lot, how it, how it differs from roommate, because roommate was in finding a roommate, that's fair, how there can be potential fair housing violations there, et cetera. So like there, and they, it go, went further in the categories were really discriminatory. Whereas here it's just simple gender, but I think that there's a little bit of ambiguity there. And then they also had something for a section for additional comments where there's no development. So this is very clear cut, the first one. The second one is a little bit, um, this, the second one, uh, first and second one rather, I think really the second one has the most, um, oh no, I think the first one um, is where you could do the counter argument. Um, so I concluded that there was immunity, but additional information, the one thing that I want to know is looking at these gender listings, you know, one way that it could potentially be construed is if you think about like current, you know, the state and when I go in, like, it's something I always notice. Um, and I think there's like generational differences here. So don't come at me for this. Um, but you know, like the listing, like the variety, is it just listing male, female? Is it giving different options other than just regular male, female? Um, so like we would want to kind of, I would want to know a little bit about that to talk and advise about potential 
like potential ways you could make sure that there was no discrimination or is that going to open up to discrimination? Is there a possibility of removing gender from that? So to advise our client as well, and then you would have a conclusion. All right, so that's the PT. Again, I'm doing a deep dive into that and we'll have fun with that. So questions. And I'm gonna turn off the presentation. It'll just be me. Anybody have any questions? Put them in the Q&A. If there's anything we didn't get to, we'll go through and check the questions, check the chat for questions as we went through um, and get back to you. So yeah, oh yeah, that's right. I wanna talk about that. Thanks, Melanie. Um, so one thing you ought to do, and you should definitely, definitely do this, is print out the fact patterns. So print out these essays from the Cal Bar. They're freely available. Print them out. Also print out your essays that you wrote. Go through, read through your essay and say, okay, you know, read through the fact pattern, read through your essay and go through. Say, did I use this little fact? Did I use this little fact? Did I use this little fact? Go through every little fact and use a highlighter and literally highlight it if you used it. Highlight it if you used it. Um, and then go through and look at the fact and like really be critical. It's not just did you state that fact? Did you actually explain that? Like, does is that fact next to the word because? Because it should be, right? And writing your analysis. Um, so go through every single essay and be very discerning and ask yourself whether or not you went um, went through and address every fact. And if you didn't, you need to say, where could I have used this fact? And I do that in our policies course. I do that. In our PT course, um, uh, in our PT course, also I go really in depth into a bunch of PTs. So you got to organize and structure, and like, what do you do when you have no idea? All of that stuff. Um, spend on Rulex does not apply. I I don't spend a whole lot of time on Rulex does not apply. Like I don't do that. I only include rules that apply. And Liz, uh, if you have a score review appointment, you've got to schedule a score review appointment and then send us your essays and PT and your score letter, and we'll go over everything with you. But do that exercise and um, I hope to see a lot of you all soon. I hope to see you in score reviews. I hope to see you all in class and in the workshops. Um, so uh, yeah, if you have any other questions, you can always feel free to reach out. Um, Anna, I'd have to look if you could send us an email and we'll double check or Noelle if you can look at that. Um, oh, Monday at six o'clock, the six o'clock. Michael, what is an answer for above? You have to just go further in depth within the facts. You have to use more facts and do more analogizing and distinguishing. Of course. And we'll put a link to all of the different courses. We'll put a link. Um, we'll send that out to you. Also, if you do want to see that book that we have coming out in December with the, like a lot of the California essay templates, it's a lot of strategy on saving time and like how much of the rule, et cetera. I'm really excited about it because I know there's other templates that exist, but the thing that is different about this the thing that is different is that it will, um, I'm going to talk about strategy and I'm going to talk about time. Include this rule only if this is triggered. Don't, if you're running out of time, shorten your rule like this. So stuff like that. So a lot, I'm not just going to like overload you. I'm going to talk. I always like to say, this is how you get a 55. This is how you get a 60. This is how you get a 65. Let's look at that. And um, uh, let's look at that and, um, you know, and figure out how to write a passing answer, how to get um, how to get to a, you know, get to a passing answer, how to really manage your time. Uh, if it's IO, uh, not just yet, we might do that, but not just yet. Um, the MBE workshop on the 20th is going to be going through some strategies, some topics. Uh, we're going to talk about some tips, like interpreting your MBE score, how to really prep for the MBE, how to use various tools, um, how to dig into your answers, like really what does effective MBE prep look like? Because it's not just doing questions. Yeah, Jasmine, we can definitely do that. Thank you all so much for sticking out. I know 90 minutes is a long time, but I'm so happy that you are all here. If you have any questions about anything, please, please feel free to reach out. I look forward to seeing all of you uh, in the coming months. I know that nobody wants to retake this exam. Um, it sucks, but, um, but we can like figure out a plan for all of you and get you across that line. So if you have any questions about that, you know, definitely feel free to reach out. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so, so, so much. I love doing this. So thank you. Thanks, Christy. So good to see you. All right, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and end it. Thanks.